Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our distillation series. I must admit, I have I have lost count as to which installation we are in the series. However, what I can say is that we are in the book of Samuel. We started Samuel last week, whereby we went through first Samuel. We touched on second Samuel and then realized that we needed a part two. So this serves as the part two to dive deeper into second Samuel. And before that, we will glance again over first Samuel. I trust that you have your Bibles in hand and you're ready to thumb through the word of God. But before we proceed any further, Hanif, I would like to ask you to just invite God's spirit to lead through prayer. I think you're on, you're muted, honey. Would you? Would you just pray? You hear me? Okay, good. Perfect. Gracious Father, anyway, we thank you so much, the mighty God, for the everlasting love. We thank you for your everlasting um, kindness, your everlasting power towards us. I pray in a very special way, dear God, that you will please come within our midst and heal us, Lord, from all the damage that has been done from sin, especially as it, result, as it um, relates to our, our willingness to, to listen to your Holy Spirit. I pray that you'll start the healing process and that you will reveal your character to us tonight as we study the book of Second Samuel. Pray that you will be lifted up and we will be drawn closer to you. May your will be done, great God. Be with our discussion now. These we ask in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Hannah. So to proceed, I would like to just play part two of the overview of the second Samuel. I, I love the Bible Project. I believe they have a very excellent project there which they're undertaking to basically bring scripture to life in the sense of making it visual. Some of us perhaps understand things better when we can see a visual and have it, you know, presented to us in that fashion. So I am going to just go ahead now and share my screen and uh, invite us to watch this. <clears throat> it's about five minutes or a little close to six minutes on the overview of Second Samuel. And I, if you're unable to hear or see the screen, kindly indicate to me. I am going to be playing it now. The book of 2 Samuel. Check out the video on 1 Samuel where we were introduced to the book's three main characters, Samuel, Saul, and David, and then also to the book's literary design which first introduced Samuel and then traced the rise and fall of King Saul in contrast to the rise of King David. 2 Samuel tells the story of David as Israel's king and in two movements. There's a season of success and a blessing followed by a huge moral failure and then its sad consequences. And then the book ends with this well-crafted conclusion that reflects back on the good and the bad in David's life, generating hope for a future king to come from his line. So 2 Samuel picks up after Saul's death, and David surprises everyone by composing this long poem where he laments the death of the very man who tried to murder him. And so once again, the author, he's presenting David's humility and compassion. He's a man who grieves the death 
even of his own enemies. After this, David experiences a season of success and God's blessing. All of the Israelite tribes, they come to David and then they ask him to unify all the tribes as their king. And so the first thing David does as king is to go to the city of Jerusalem. He conquers it and he establishes it as Israel's capital city, which he renames as Zion. And from there, David goes on and he wins many battles and expands Israel's territory. Now, after making Jerusalem the political capital of Israel, he wants to make it their religious capital as well. And so he has the Ark of the Covenant moved into the city. And then in 2 Samuel 7, he tells God, now that Israel has a permanent home, he thinks that God's presence should also get a permanent house. So he asks if he can build a temple for the God of Israel. But God says to David, thank you for that thought, but actually I'm going to build you a house, a dynasty. Now, 2 Samuel 7, this is a key chapter for understanding the storyline of the whole Bible. Because God here makes a promise to David that from his royal line will come a future king who's going to build God's temple here on earth and set up an eternal kingdom. And it's this messianic promise to David that gets picked up and developed more in the book of Psalms and also in the books of the prophets. And it's this king that gets connected to God's promise to Abraham, the future messianic kingdom will be how God brings his blessing to all of the nations. And it's right here in the midst of all this divine blessing that things go horribly wrong. David makes a fatal mistake, not fatal for him, but for a man named Uriah, one of David's prized soldiers. So from his rooftop, David sees Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, bathing. David finds her, he sleeps with her, gets her pregnant, and then he tries to cover the whole thing up by having Uriah assassinated and then marrying her. It's just horrible. So when David's confronted by the prophet Nathan about all of this, he immediately owns up to what he's done. He's broken, he repents, he asks God to forgive him, and God does forgive him, but God doesn't erase the consequences of David's decisions. And so as a result of this horrible choice, David's family, his kingdom, it all falls apart. And it makes this section a tragic story, much like Saul's downfall. So David's sons end up repeating his own mistakes, but in even more tragic ways. So Amnon sexually abuses his sister Tamar, and then their brother Absalom finds out about all of this and has Amnon assassinated. And then Absalom goes and he hatches the secret plan to oust his father David from power, and he launches this full-scale rebellion. And so for a second time, David is forced to flee from his own home and go hide in the wilderness, except this time he is not an innocent man. The rebellion ends when David's son is murdered, and it breaks David's heart. And so once again, he laments over the very man who tried to kill him. David's last days find him back on his throne, but as a broken man, he's wounded by the sad consequences of his sin. The book concludes with a well-crafted epilogue, with stories that are out of chronological order, but they have this really cool symmetrical literary design. So the outer pair of stories come from earlier in David's reign, and they compare the failures of Saul and then of David, and how each of them hurt other people through their bad decisions. The next inner pair of stories are about David and his band of mighty men who went about fighting the Philistines. And what's interesting is that both sections have a story of David's weakness in battle. So in contrast to the victorious David of chapters 1 through 9, here we see a vulnerable David who's dependent on others for help. The center of the epilogue has two poems that act like memoirs, and David reflects back on his life. And he remembers times when God graciously rescued him from danger. And he sees these as moments where God was faithful to his covenant promise to him and to his family. Both poems conclude by looking back onto the hope of God's promise of a future king who will build that eternal kingdom. Now these poems and then God's promise also connect back to Hannah's poem that opened the book. And so these key passages from the beginning, now the middle, and the end of the book bring the book's themes all together. Despite Saul and David's evil, God remained at work moving forward his redemptive purposes. And God opposed David and Saul's arrogance, but he exalted David when he humbled himself. And so the future hope of this book reaches far beyond David himself. It looks to the future, to the messianic king who will one day bring God's kingdom and blessing to all of the nations. And that's what the book of Samuel is all about.
All right, excellent. So this evening, myself and Brother Hanif Morrison will be leading out in this study. Just a reminder, the purpose of our study is to one, have us go through the scripture and be familiar with the contents thereof. So understand how things are taking place sequentially. In addition to that, we ask ourselves the question, what does this reveal about the character of God? How do we see God in every line, in every precept, in everything, even though it may seem far-fetched, how does it reveal more to us about God's character? So as we go through the study, let us bear that question in mind. So, Elder, as we looked at the video just now, gave us a proper overview, a visual overview over the book of Samuel. I also appreciated how they would have chunked it because the different chapters can basically be combined under various themes. And so just to remind us what those themes are, we see whereby the book started off with David being triumphant. So David experienced political triumph, David experienced spiritual triumph, and even under political, again, that would include military triumph. And while David was on his high, he would have stumbled, unfortunately. And so he fell to the sin of adultery and furthermore, he degraded to the sin of murder. Unfortunately, in our, in our modern society, perhaps some would say, well, postmodern society, adultery may not be as frowned upon in pop culture. However, murder generally is frowned upon. But what this reveals to us is that starting with something that looks small eventually can lead to greater disaster. And we see that unfolding beyond just David himself, whereby trouble entered into David's house, where his children started to fall in dramatic fashion and the trouble expanded even further into the wider kingdom. So it's under these themes that we are exploring the question, what this reveals about God's character. Elder, anything would you like to share at this point in time as we you know, turn to you know, Eva, Eva, as you discuss uh, the book of uh, Second Samuel, you see, David, um, it's, it's a very interesting book. Um, we see, we see um, what can happen to the best of us, and and it, and, and it shows that you know the the um, the victories for yesterday's victories aren't enough for today. It is yeah. it shows that we are today making um, spiritual victories, you know, um, right throughout our lives every single day. And, and, and that is done by looking to, to Jesus and beholding his character, beholding his power, you know, and, and allowing that to sustain us. And as you, you rightly said, you know, the, the key question is, what does this say about God? Because Jesus, on one occasion, in talking to the Jews, he said that, listen to me, man, listen to me. You're searching the scriptures because I think by knowing the Psalms, committing them to memory and so forth, um, you will have eternal life by that. And Jesus said, no, they really talk about me. You know, and then Jesus, uh, another, another in, 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 in his prayer um, for his disciples, he said, to know God is a life eternal. And that no is really to have a relationship with God. So what we are doing here, when we say we are distilling the truth about God, that is, that is, remove, that is seeing the pure truth about who God is, as pure as it can get, you know, is very vital to our Christian growth and development, you know? So, so even as we, as, as we study the scriptures, we should see to find out what they say about God. No, 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 um, second Samuel, um, David. Oh, it's funny, we're talking about David, um, your namesake, too. <laughs> Samuel, yes, David. yes, you know. Um, I guess this, this probably is your favorite book, 
I mean, it, the account of David is one that I've always looked at with keen interest. For the simple yeah, fact that he's my namesake, but he his his life is so real. Mm-hmm. You know, we look at the life of Joseph, we look at the life of Daniel, for example, we look at the life of many others, even Moses, and these men, they you can learn so much from them. They, they seem to have walked a very tight path, even though Moses sinned great sin. Uh, we, I don't see any recorded sin against Daniel or against Joseph, but nevertheless, we have many other accounts of characters in the scripture, major characters mm-hmm. that is, whereby they seem to have walked a straight and narrow. David is one, however, whereby he committed some of the most egregious of sins, and mm-hmm. yet still, he was called a man after God's own heart, and David demonstrated what repentance really is. He was the first character for me who unfolded repentance, particularly through the Psalms. And as such, we came to, I have come to realize rather that repentance is not just saying, oh God, I did something, please forgive me. Though that has its place, Genuine repentance is like a wellspring. It bubbles up and it keeps springing forth, so much so that David penned some of the most beautiful and elaborate psalms because he was so sorrowful for what he had had done, the sins and the atrocities he had committed. And what it says to me is that to be truly regretful of one sin is to truly turn away from it, to shun it, and seek to replace it with that which is holy, with that which is good. And so it shows me that repentance is a process and to experience true repentance, I need to undergo that process. So David for me is one of the, one of the real characters, so to say, one which we can learn very practical applications for life. And, and, and also David had a spirit of excellence. The fact that David was just a shepherd boy And he, as we see in 1 Samuel, would have put himself, made himself rather available to be used by God and was used so mightily by God. And when David was on his upward trajectory, he was still mindful of God, whereby he said to God, let me build you a temple. Let me build you a host. You know, you're giving us so much great things. We need to give something back to you. So David was still mindful of God. And, and and so, yeah, I, I always love the character, David. <laughs> I, I can see. So, so let's jump into it now. Um, the first yes. part of it talks about um, Saul's death, I believe. Well, David mourning for, for Saul's death. Yes, yes we we'll pick up there. Um, and, and you mentioned David being a, a, a man after God's own heart, which basically means that um, when you look at David, David's life, at least for the most part, you know, is, is, is supposed to say something about God. And, when, yes. and, and, and the part in his, in his life that doesn't say something about God, that actually made it known that, listen, this is not, is, is not representing me well here. You know, so, so, so we don't uh, have any misunderstanding. But, but look, at, look at how David reacted to, to, to the news of Saul's death. You know, remember, you know, the, the promise was, the, the kingdom was promised to David. And Saul, being aware of that, actually got jealous and, 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 saw, and, and tried to kill David. He was after him, you know. Um, at about two, two um, instances, I can remember, find it back in, back in um, first Samuel, where David had the opportunity to, to murder, to, well, to kill Saul. It was all yes. It, it, in fact, it said that 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 the Lord delivered the enemy into His mm. hand. Yes, indeed. You know, you know, but He didn't, and 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 and, and he, he didn't want to touch the Lord's anointed, and He had this this um this this um this brother now. Don't remember his name. That even well, though even didn't... press pass it, honey. Could we ask the question? What does that itself even reveal about God? The fact that the enemy was delivered right into the camp, but it seems like you're going to it. Go ahead. Remember, that, that's that's the question I was heading to. You yeah. know, it seemed the enemy was delivered in the camp. David was in the cave. David went in the camp, you know, and he could have killed Saul, and he didn't. No, Saul is dead. And 
The news came today with that. Saul is dead. And it was Berman that, that, that wanted the honor of killing Saul. You know, Carl, Saul killed himself um, partially. But wanted the honor of killing, of killing um, Saul. Came to David and, and David actually, you know, ordered the assassination of, of that man. You know, and, and, and yes. we see David mourning for Saul. What does yes. that say about God? Remember, David is a man after God's own heart in this. In this right. what, what does that say about God to you and, and to anybody else who might, who might be on, on, on the line? Well, I've been speaking for quite a bit. I'm, I'm, I'll allow someone else to share. Yes. So the question is, what does it say about God? The fact that David would have been, or the enemy would have been delivered into the hands of David, but he was not slow he was not quick rather to execute judgment or retribution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Anybody has anything they'd like to share on that point? Um, Sister Sonia Brown says, good evening, everyone. Very interesting analysis of the story of David. Yeah, man, it's, it's really an interesting story, you know, and we get excited about it whenever we get a chance to speak of it. You know, what does it say about, what does David's um, actions in, 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 in the first part of, of, of the book as we outline says about God? Anybody? While they're thinking about it, <clears throat> and feel free to just raise a hand or chime in at any point in time. But while they're thinking about it, I think it's pretty, I, I would say it's, 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 it's pretty obvious what it says about God. Mm -hmm. We know that, for example, um, the Lord is slow to anger, yes? We also know that God does not seek to destroy, but rather he seeks to save that which is lost. He seeks to find that which is lost. Mm -hmm. And so Saul was pursuing David to kill him. Mm -hmm. The true Messiah, when he came, he was being pursued or he was being pursued to death, unto death. In fact, there were several instances where there were angry mobs who sought to kill Christ. And we know that at the cross, it was really the devil, his ultimate enemy, who tried mm -hmm. to kill him. However, with that said, so we see a parallel there between the life of David and, 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 and Christ, whereby David was sought for death. Likewise, Christ came to die for our, in our place. We see whereby David, though he had many opportunities, at least two recorded instances, to get rid of Saul, at the same time, David one had such a respect for God that he stated he should not touch the Lord's anointed. In fact, it is saying to me, it reminds me of when Christ was in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Christ said, if this cup uh, could pass from me, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Even, in the, even, even when you're face to face with the enemy, David sought not his own will. Rather, he allowed God to unfold his will. And so, you have something to share, honey? You, you, you have something to share, but, but finish. Yes, so I was, I was going to say... That's a very powerful point I, I, I just want to add. Yeah, man. So I would conclude by saying that in essence, you know, Jamaicans would have a thing to say whereby we, we give more room yeah. to hang yourself. It's on, it's on our way. However, the truth is God, or David rather, allowed Saul to reveal the true nature of his heart. And that is what God does. In the end, ultimately, sin will reveal itself, the true nature of the heart of those which are classified as wicked. They will reveal the true nature of their heart in the end. And it is out of their wickedness which they, would be, they will be consumed. Unfortunately, they say you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Well, Saul, that, that, that became true for Saul whereby he unfortunately died under terrible circumstances. It wasn't the will of David that that took place. Nevertheless, in a sense, it could be said that Saul 
brought it unto himself through his wicked acts. Yet, you know, you know, David, I, I'm beaming now because that's a very forceful point. Um, remember, we're looking at this through the lens of the great controversy. Satan casting accusation against God in heaven. The angels were confused. You know, in heaven, the angels were confused, looking on now. And instead of God making mere claims to win the great controversy, um, what God did was to let it play out on earth. And that is why Paul says that this earth is a theater to everybody, the entire universe is looking on. So I believe what we see in here, as you rightly said, um, David, is that God is teaching the angels something about himself through David. Yes. Many times we read the Bible from through the lens of our own salvation. And I think that is why Ellen White, um, in the earlier part of great of um, patriarchs and prophets says that, listen, it's not only for our redemption that the plan of salvation was given and, and in many other places, he says that, listen, angels benefit from the death of Christ too. Angels were one to trust by the death of Christ. Angels were one to trust by the stories here in the Bible. You know, and, and even, even stories like those in, um, in Judges that, that, we, that we don't even preach about, you know, that, that, that baffles us. These stories were lessons to the angels. The angels understood. And I think this now that 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 that, 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 that might baffle some of us is a lesson to the angels. And though it is that nobody on earth probably understood, the angels understood. It said something to them about God. Satan cast the accusation in heaven. You know, God is arbitrary exacting severe and come uh, come come down to now to either satan said said that listen satan said that listen god will just wipe you out if you if, if you if you rebel against him so god let it play out what i want to add is that how you respond how you treat your friend doesn't say much about you as a person you know? What says something about you as a person? How oh, you treat your enemies? Yes. The text in, in, in Matthew that says, therefore be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Many times we, we, we look at that in the context of, of keeping the law, the obey the health message, just reform, every reform, you know. What, and, what are the two greatest commandments? Precisely. Every reform, and we might even turn in the process of trying to be perfect, we might even turn reforms into deforms, you know? But in the same chapter of be perfect, it, talk, it is talking about loving your enemies. And Jesus is actually saying, when you can love your enemies the way God loves his enemies, then you are perfect. Then guess what? You, you, are, you are safe to save. You know? So David, you now look at how David treated his enemies. You know, David mourned for his enemies. David, you will see where David um, was trying to preserve the good memories of Saul. And I think that, is, that says something very important to us about God, how God treats his enemies. Look at how God, um, Jesus treated, um, treated Judas. And, if and, I can and, back on a point on it, um, when you're two, I would ask you to read for us Matthew 5, verse 45, when you're through making the point. Yeah, man. And, and I know many of us are, are waiting for God to just give the wicked what they deserve in the end. You know, we can't wait for God to just burn them up in fire. And, and we have that, that view of God. And, 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 and because we think God is, is exacting and God is arbitrary and God, God is um, revengeful like that, we too become like that because we, we become like the one who we worship and admire. So that is why we find that we are, there are so many churches in, in Jamaica and yes, we are such an evil nation. Mercy. Because Mercy. that's what we, we worship <clears throat> the wrong God, I believe. 
worship, many of us are worshiping God is, God is arbitrary, revengeful, severe, and exacting, and those who are Satan's charges against God. That is why we're still in the truth. So we can so we can see what God is like, you know. And 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 I, and I think that put a different spin on how we even preach the the, the third angel's message. Third angel's message says God, it will pour out. God will pour out His wrath. What does that really mean? When we get there, I'm hoping that is something we will um we will look at. You said um Matthew what? Fifth chapter of Matthew verse forty five. Matthew. 45. All right, um, Matthew 5, verse 45. And it says that you may be sons of your father in heaven, for he makes the sun shine, rise upon the evil and the good, and sends rain on the just and unjust. Yes. Amen. Yeah. I, I, think that, I think Jesus, where, where, where do you think Jesus get that from? The Old Testament. Mm. Remember, Jesus studied the scripture. You know? So in the Old Testament, we see, we, we even see this coming out. Well, guess what? I think many times we have to read the stories to find out. The yes. key text thing, I mean, even see David has, has, has done great damage to us as, as Christians, as, as Adventists. We have the key text. You know, key text, most of, most of, most of the time, are mere claims. And God doesn't seek to win the great controversy through claims. God mm -hmm. seeks to win the great controversy through stories. And, and we, give, we give the stories to the children. And we, we keep the key text. So even in our portal, is, we see it is littered with, with key texts. Key texts are good, you know, friends. But I believe we can we see, we see the, the, the storyline. And we see God revealing himself through the stories then we have the evidence and that is the evidence that we should build our faith on. You know, yes. truth about God. Key texts are mere claims. True evidence is in what we give to our children stories. All right, David, do have, you have anything to, to add? Yes, yeah, so I will certainly echo that point that stepping back and understanding the larger picture does help in getting to a right understanding and helps us to understand deeper the truths that exist. So in, in, in understanding David and his triumph, his political triumph, I would love to be able to pull up this and share it on the screen. I had it last week, however, I don't have it this week, unfortunately. I'm going to try and put it up at some point. However, the essence is when God blesses you, be prepared for an increase in your territory. You know, scripture does mm. tell us that he who is faithful in little, it is expected that he'll be faithful in much. And oftentimes, when God leads us through certain circumstances in life, it is possible, I'm not saying this will always be the case in this life, but it's possible that while we are here, God is preparing us to take on larger responsibilities. And oftentimes, I will just quick haste, haste and quickly to say that larger responsibilities doesn't always look like what we expect or think it will look like. However, once God gives us certain talents or certain gifts he expects us to use them and use them well so that we can be used even further if he so desires so we saw whereby when david took over the territory the geographical area from saul it was a relatively small area in comparison to when david was king and throughout his reign, when they conquered the other lands around them, how the territory grew. So one of the things I, I, I would point out here is that David, through his, 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 his honoring of God's com commandments, right, was able to see an increase in the territory and an increase in the blessings thereof to the people. And 
that was a fulfillment of the promise that God would have given in earlier in Genesis when he gave the promise to who was it Abraham? Mm -hmm. Yes. That would have been a fulfillment of the promise when God had promised that the territory would be increased. And furthermore, that would have been a demonstration of God's favor being upon David. So there are those times when we see God's favor being shown. So I would like to add that. I find it interesting. And, and, and I just say it again to encourage us that oftentimes you may just be tending sheep right now. You may be faced with your life's Goliath. You may have to be wrestling a bear or a, or a lion. Whatever it is, whatever circumstance it is that you're facing now, remember the bigger that God sees the bigger picture. He sees beyond that instant where you're facing the bear and you're thinking, this is the end of my life. If God preserves you, he has a greater purpose for you. If God has preserved you through some sickness, it is because he has a greater purpose for you. If God has led you through a course of study and you're facing an exam that's perhaps on a Sabbath and you're thinking, whoa, God has abandoned me. Perhaps not. It's probably because he has a greater purpose for you and this might just very well be a necessary catalyst as a part of that journey. So that's something I was able to draw out of David's experience being triumphant on the throne. You know, you know um, thank you very much for that point. David, um, one thing I want to add before we move on the more to, to the middle part of the book is how oh, David knew God, you know, David was a friend of God. We see, you see, that um, even before David, I, I would see even this from, from in first Samuel, you know, before David go up to fight against anybody david inquired inquire of the lord and and look at look at verse verse 19 of chapter 5 when when david when, when the philistines heard that david is, is a new big man in town and, and they and they came up to war against him so david didn't say i am king now so i'm just going on my own so david knew david and that shows a trust the, the level of trust and confidence that david had in god he said, so David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I go up against the Philistine? You will, will you deliver them into my hand? So David, and, 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 it, and that is all God really asked, so you know, it's for us to trust him. Yes. And, and it's, it's really for us to trust him. And so I just wanted to, to bring up that um, point. Um, before we, I want to jump to, to, um, to, to David's, so David and Oz and the, and the ark, you know that story, Oz and the, and the ark, which they were, they were taking the, the carrying the, the ark you now on, on, on a cart. And the cart was, the ark was falling off the, 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 the cart and Oz um, stretched out his, his, his hand to, 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 to secure it, it would appear. And, and God um, killed him. You know, let me, let me put it that way. The question is, you know, we asked, we, see, we asked earlier, do we see David treating his enemies good? Um, no, look at what, what God did to, to us. What does that say about God? Mm. You know, why, why would God be? We, we, have to, we have to balance it, you know. We yes. have to ask those hard questions too. What does that yes. say about you? Beautiful question, honey, because this is one that we wanted to touch on last week, actually. And uh, unfortunately, because of time, we were not able to, to touch on it. Uh, while we think about that question, what does it say about God for killing a man who just seems to be merely trying to save, you know, the ark? Mm -hmm. I would just like to go ahead and share that. Uh, uh, the, the photo right now um, as to how the territory was increased. You're supposed to be able to see it on your screen. This area, I'm not sure if you can, not sure if you can see my cursor over and over it, the image, but yes, the area that, you seen it? 
Yes, we see me. So this area here, which the cursor is encircling, uh, would have been the area that would have that that Saul would have reigned over. So this was the extent of Saul's kingdom, right? And this area in the green would have been the area which was ex which, was, which the kingdom was expanded by during the reign of David. Now this, just eyeballing it, compared to this, it looks like it was at least a two, possibly three times increase, at least two times increase in the size of the kingdom. Then when Solomon eventually uh, came to power, we saw whereby the kingdom to the north or the air territory to the north was also conquered by the Israelites. Oh. So powerful. When you can look at the imagery, how God, how through service to God, David was able to expand the sphere of influence. Whoa, whoa, powerful, you know? And, 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 and I'm, you know, and that shows that when we have trust in God, and trust in God, friends, is really you've been willing to listen and obey God. When we have trust in God, God trusts us too. Yes. So it is so it's mutual trust. And that and that is it. I think that is that is really how we can restore. That is all really how peace, safety, and happiness will be restored in the universe when we trust God, and God trusts us. And that is all that we, that God really asks for. When God when God trusts us, God can give us more. God can bless us with more. When God can't trust us, David, God can't bless us more because we're going to use it for our destruction and destruction of others. All right, so, so the story of Hosea and the Ark. Let me, let me read yes. it. Let me read it. Um, it's, it's, it's found in 2 Samuel chapter 6. I'm going to read verses 1 to, to 9. Again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Berli, um, Judah, to bring up. Oh, to bring up there the ark of God, whose name is called the name of the Lord of hosts who dwells between the cherubims. So they set the ark of God on a new cart. Remember, I know. Yes, and, and this, I believe, shows how far the people would have wandered away from God. There were specific instructions as to how the, the ark should be carried. Who yes. should carry it? You know, and, 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 and so listen to this now. They set the ark of God on a new cart. So they weren't supposed to be, be, be carrying it in, in carts. You know? So, so, like so can we pause and ask ourselves here, honey, that in the midst of crisis, do we throw out the requirements of God? Not at all. You know? So, 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 so God requires obedience. You know, and, and yes, and I will discuss the quality of obedience by the prayers later. And brought it out of the house of, of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Oza and Ahihu, the son of Abin, Abinadab, drove the new cart, you know, and they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, accompanying the ark of, of God. And Ahihu went before the ark, and David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments and fir wood, on harps, on string instruments, on tambourines, on sistrums, and on cymbal, cymb yeah, cymbals, cymbals. And when they came to Nacon, threshing floor, Oza put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. Then the, then the anger of the Lord was arose against Oza, and God struck him there for his terror, and he died there by the ark of God. And David, came, and David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Oza and called the name of the place Perez Oza to this day. 
David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? You know, and, and, and I think this is probably something that you highlighted earlier, um, David, that David was, was genuine. Just David was honest. He says David was angry. David could understand well, because this is this is God's, this is David's friend knowing him. David, God has been uh, David uh, uh, and, and God, they are friends. David yes. knew God. And David, uh, it's David couldn't understand why God would do something like this. So David was angry. And the question is, what does that say about God? Why would God do something like this? Anybody want to take on that one? Remember, you know, Satan has accused God of being arbitrary. Let me find, let me find the text. That, that text is, let me, let me is, a, is a, an interesting string of adjectives. Arbitrary, exacting. Yes, <laughs> Demanding, me, severe, unforgiving. Yes, let, let, let me find it. You know, um, where's the picking thing, from also? It's, 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 it's um, in, in an article that written by Ellen White in the Signs of the Time. Um, so I think it's January 1890. You know, two years, couple months after, well, two years after the, the Minneapolis General Conference. And I believe after that conference, um, Ellen White's view of the, of the plan of salvation, you know, shifted a bit. I think that conference, the truth that was expressed at that conference actually was a missing link. And, 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 and it was after that conference, you wrote many, you know, beautiful things. Material. Beautiful material about, about, about God, about the gospel. And it was after that she wrote books like Steps to Christ. After that she wrote books like um, Christ. Is that ages was wrote, written on that time? Yes. You know, and, and what, a, what a marvelous... Uh, um, uh, um, manifestation, a uh, revelation of God's character, you know, and 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 and, and I think it, it 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 will it will do really good to us, David, if we if we go back and study these things. Let me read the really quotation. Um, Satan sought to intercept. This is talking about before Jesus, when Jesus came um to earth. You know, she, 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 this, she's describing, you know, the, the atmosphere and what was happening before. Satan sought to intercept every ray of light from the throne of God. He sought to cast his shadow across the earth that men may lose sight of, sorry, that he sought to cast his shadow across the earth that men might lose the true views of God's character and that the knowledge of God might become extinct in the earth. He had caused the truth of vital importance to be so mingled with error that it had lost its significance. The law of Jehovah was burdened with needless exactions and traditions and God was represented as being severe, exacting, revengeful, and arbitrary. So Satan used the same scripture, I believe he used stories like these, to paint God as being severe, arbitrary, exacting, and revengeful. You know? So and 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 and, and when we read this, read it at the surface, many of us might leave with that view of God. We might not be so brave to express it. And, and, and I think it, what it does is it, so it's so, it's so cripple of faith in God because you cannot trust a God that is arbitrary, exacting, vengeful, and severe. So I think it, it, is, it is very important that we, that we look at and, and, and to find out why God would, would, would act in a manner like this. Because I think God is putting his representation on the line. Satan has been making these accusations. Why would God even put his representation on the line? You know, and, and, and I think God has been 
very gracious to us in giving yes. us the counsels of Helen White. You know, that's, that, that's just shed, that shed a lot of light on, on some of these issues. From Patriots and Prophets, she read, where she says, Upon us arrest the greater guilt of presumption, transgression of God's law had lessened, lessened its sense a sense of its sacredness, and with unconfessed and with unconfessed sins upon his hand, in face of the divine prohibition, presumed to touch the symbols of God's uh, presence. God cannot accept no partial obedience, no lax way of treating his commandments. By the judgment upon Oza, he designed to impress upon all Israel importance of strict heed to his requirements. Yes. And 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 we if we need to remember the context, the background also, when David became king of Israel, Israel as a nation was pretty far removed from the standard by which God had called them to be, which is the very reason why the ark was lost in the first place they started to see the things of God as being subject to their will. And as such, they went, they fetched the ark out of God's temple to bring forth into a battle so that it could be, as we had coined the term last week, their lucky charm to help them in winning a battle. So God would have stepped back and allowed the ark to be taken away from the camp of Israel. And finally, no, David rising to the throne. The people didn't overnight become converted. And so within their heart, there was still that instance of not putting in the right place the sacredness of God's emblems, of God's precepts, of his requirements. And so with a trivializing attitude, knowing better, because it's not that they did not know, they would have known, but with a trivializing attitude being taken to it, God was very patient on this. It was like a, the journey was like 12 miles. And this is just the culmination of everything. God was very patient with them. So in this final instance, it's like a straw breaking the camel's back. Here it is. We see Hosea reaching out. Perhaps, who knows, maybe a long time in, in his heart, him thinking, boy, boy, I touched that ark, you know. Now is the opportunity. Yes, now is the opportunity, perhaps. Maybe not, but who knows? So what we can say with certainty is that God's patience was demonstrated throughout her Samuel into this aspect of, of, of the book. I you know, David, I, I'm really happy that God was willing to put his representation on the line because remember, Satan would have, would have, would have, even after after being so, so long suffering as you would have, would you would have said, God was willing to put his representation on his reputation okay. on the line. You know, after being accused with all these strings of, of adjectives, you know, and the angels looking on, God was really willing to run the risk of being painted like that, just so truth could be preserved. And, and you, you know, you know what? One thing that is common when I see God acting this way, God had no, God had to do this to preserve truth and and some other reverence and to set the record straight. Or else, I believe if God never acted this way in 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 these times, I don't think God likes to act this way. But God, God, God does it, and God never acted this way, then we wouldn't have the truth that has been preserved. Yeah. Because rebellion is is is, is that is infectious disease, and 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 and, it, and it, if it is left untreated, it spreads like a cancer. It spreads like like a cancer, and, and it kills everybody. It takes everything out of the way, and and, and, and righteousness would not be preserved. And 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 remember, God has been accused, and the, and the entire universe hadn't gotten the answer as yet. So God couldn't have allowed this to, to take place. 
And you know, many times we look at God at, at death in the Bible. This is not, Jesus made, set this straight enough. This is just God putting us at the sleep. This is just God putting us at the sleep. Mm -hmm. This is not mm -hmm. the death that results from sin. And, and, and I know we would have felt a little bit of said, God, then God put us at the sleep and is still sleeping this day. It's really the same thing. It's, it's not like Oza is in pain anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, God just had to put him to sleep so righteousness can be could be preserved. You know, if, if there's nothing else, we that's, can. That's what I'm looking at it. Yes, yes that's, that's, it's, it's, that is like a sin. And I know many times, even in our, in our, in our bid to, to defend the, the doctrine of the, 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 the non immortality of the soul, we, we, um, we cause people to think that it, 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 is not, it is not so far that, you know, that the soul is immortal in a sense. We know that the soul is, is not immortal, but when you die, it's like you go to sleep. The next conscious moment you have, you will be face to face with God. Well, that is if face to face at the second we hope. That uh, is the great face to face with Him at the, at the final resurrection. Yes, you know, so it is hope. just like a sleep. So God just put you know, put it to sleep, and God has to put some people to sleep, so that people who, who people who want to be saved, you know, and has the potential of being saved. You know, can be saved. Well, hey, the question could be in some people's mind. Uh, why does it seem like God is more long-suffering with some than others? Good, good question. Um, you want to? Anybody want to, to add to that? I'm throwing this one out to the to the to the wider group. Mm -hmm. but, good question. Well, like God is perhaps more long-suffering to some than he is to others. And uh, what, what does this reveal about God? How, how can we? I'd better understand that because that sounds that seems to me to be as a contrary to, to God's character. And, and, and the Bible says God is a respecter of person. So I believe the, the, the group is thinking about that one. We'd really like to hear the feedback. Uh, while you're thinking about it, we press on with the study. And as we wind down in the end, I'll bring back the question and ask to see if someone has something to share on the matter. So shall we dive into David's unfortunate decline? Yes, you know, sure. I think yes. it's a word that. <laughs> yes. So, I believe it's what, chapter 11? Chapter 11 of 2 Samuel. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we see David uh, in verse 1. Let's read verse 1 to 5. I'll read for us. Chapter 11, verse 1 to 5. Or better yet, let me ask uh, someone from the group. Anybody from the group, from the study? Chapter 11, verse 1 to 5. See, we have Stacy, we have Dem Demisha, we have Sonia, Tyrone, Sashana. Chap Second Samuel, chapter 11, verse 1 to 5. Anyone? Anyone who has found it can just go ahead and read. All right, I'll take it. Second Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 to 5. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And it came to pass, after the year was expired, at a time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in an even tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. 
no one was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her. And she came in unto him, and he lay with her. For she was uh, purified from her uncleanness, and uh, she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived, and sent, and told David, and said, I am with child. Thank you, Sarah. Now, last week I would have said that going through the book of Samuel was like, it's like a series on Netflix. You, 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 know, you, know, you know, you know, Sasha and I said um, the same thing earlier. You know, we were listening back over. You know, man, this is a drama series. <laughs> it's a major drama series. I mean, because one that we probably would tell our children too much. Yes, mm -hmm. actually, yes. So mm -hmm. it just goes to show that these are real issues of life, and. If David was a man after God's own heart, and David was king, was in one of the highest positions, David at the same time seemed to have his own weaknesses. And mm -hmm. the devil knows our answering cord. He knows that which will get to us. And so that's why we have to be very cautious in our walk. Because David could I name bed? David could I read to school? Whatever it is, there's nothing wrong with going out and getting some fresh air. Yeah? <laughs> but interestingly enough, he just went outside the cool of the evening and there his eyes beheld. And even then, David could have looked away, turned back and go back inside the house. However, I decided to continue to look. So mm -hmm. it just shows how imperceptible sin can be. You, 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 it's almost like you, it's almost like it came and find him. Even though he went to the room, he looked, but then the weakness of the flesh kept him looking or the curiosity of the, the, the mind or whatever it is we want to describe it. He kept looking at, at Bathsheba, and we saw a major decline from that point forward. Now, the question I would like to ask uh, the, the group, or and perhaps you as well, um, honey, mm -hmm. is that what lesson can we learn out of David's sin. I would have highlighted a few just now in terms of whenever we encounter the, the, the things that we are weak against, that we seek a means of escape as quickly as possible. Don't toy with sin. Don't play with sin. Don't crawl away from sin, perhaps somewhere in the back of your mind, hoping it will catch you and drag you right back in. Because sometimes that's how we treat it, you know. Let's be real. We crawl away from it, hoping it will catch us. Rather, we are to flee from temptation. Mm, that's right. We've not allowed it to become sin. Flee from it, run away from it, avoid it like you would the plague. Yes? So that we can learn from David's sin. What else can we learn about it? We also see that there's no, no small sin. Yes, David could say that he just looked, but out of looking, we saw what the consequences of that were or was. Mm -hmm. So any other lesson can we learn from, from this encounter? You know, Ellen White says the Bible must be taken as a whole. Um, uh, and 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 read everything, and and see the the the, the outplay of the great controversy, and see the allowing one part of the Bible to answer the other part. In Genesis, we see man being banished from the garden, 
and the man was put to work. The man never had any time to be idle. And though it is, and when, when, when we look at, looked at Genesis, we, 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 we mentioned the point that that was God being gracious to man. And here we see now, right, why God put man to work. And, and, and as we go through the book of Samuel, as we see, uh, of Second Samuel, as we see the, the, the string of events over and over. Though David lost four of his sons in, in very, very tragic and, in, and, um, and, 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 and some, in, in a way that no one, no, none of us would, would want to, to lose our son. You know, and, 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 the, and, the, and the evil and disaster that resulted from this one sin of idleness. Um, let, me, let, me, let me read this from, if, from I may add, if I may add, before you read that, honey, another important thing that I was able to identify is this. When you're mm -hmm. at the pinnacle of your career, of your walk, whatever it is, when you're on your high, you know, when spiritually things are good, you're on point. Bible study is excellent. You are guarding yourself with the word of God. You are, you, you are working faithfully. Perhaps you have a, a position in the, in, the, in, the, in the church or you're, you're, you're on a ministry group or whatever the case is. Do not for a moment ever think that it is through your own efforts, lest ye shall fall. Always, daily, consecrate yourself anew for that day, every single day, because we saw where it was when David was at his pinnacle that the devil interceded, intercepted himself and was able to cause David to fall and to fall in such a dramatic fashion, one sin after the other, after the other, the sin of love. Yeah, you had lust, then the adultery, then the lying, then the murder, just a um, total decline. Mm -hmm. Person. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says a little living, live, living live, your long. You know, a little baking powder. In other words, we just a little baking powder, swell the, 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 the dumpling. Thing, yes. There's a little bit making point. So there's a little sin of idleness caused David to commit murder and was responsible for the death of his his um his four, four, yeah, four, four children. You know, I just want to read two quotations. One talking about from, from Sister White from Patriarchs and Prophets, um 7 18. It was now while David was at ease and unguarded that the temper seized the opportunity to occupy his hand. The fact that God had taken David into so close connection with himself and had manifested so great favor toward him should have been to him the strongest of incentives to preserve his character of unblemished, preserve his character unblemished. So he's saying, and, and that is, and that is true for us. You know, when when God when God starts shows His favor, when people start to look at us and see God, then that should be the strongest incentive. That was a, that, that was a strong incentive incentive for people like Moses. Moses was jealous of God's character and God's rep representation. Likewise, we as Christians, we in God's name. We should be jealous. We, our, our, our main concern, I see David, shouldn't, shouldn't be so much, will this keep me out of heaven, you know? Our main concern should be, what does it, this really say about God? People looking on, what, what, what does my life say to people about God? And, and, it, and it, is, it, is, it is when we, we have, we are so sensitive towards God's character and God's representation especially in light of a great controversy where God is accused with, 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 of being arbitrary, exacting, severe, and vengeful, and unforgiving. Our lives should, and that is why, that is why the, the earth is, is, is a theater. But it says, I believe in Titus 2, uh, to live soberly and righteously. 
a people who are zealous of good works. Zealous of good works. Yes. Not because of legalism, zealous of good works, because we see God as a God of somebody who performs good works. You know, yes. righteousness is, is really doing the right thing at the right time for the right reason. If, if, if any of those three from, from the Trinity of righteousness is, is, um, is, is, is missing, right, then it's not righteousness. If you're not doing the right thing, of course, it's not righteousness. It's, well, well, I don't know what that is. Um, evil doing. If you're not doing, the, if you're doing the right thing, but not at the right time, not righteousness. If you're doing the right thing at the right time, but not for the right reasons, still not righteousness. And I think oftentimes we don't do the right thing for the right reasons. That is Mercy. called oftentimes it's called legalism. The right reasons Mercy. should be to preserve the character of God. You know, listen to what she says now. But when in ease and self security. He let go of his hold upon God. David yielded to Satan and brought upon his soul the stain of guilt. And you know, you know, when when we get when we get um further down into the New Testament, then we start to talk about the judgment. David said the Eliwai says that Satan has an accurate record of all his sins that he has tempted us to commit. And he presents them when our names come up. When our, our, our names come up in the judgment as a reason why he should destroy us. You know, and I just want to read this. And I'm a lot of people might, people might say, you know, well, David was a man after God's own heart. Listen to what Ellen White says. From the book, um, Testimonies on Sexual Behavior and some other sexual behavior, adultery, and um, divorce. That's, what's the name of the book? Um, Testimonies. Testimonies. And sexual behavior, adultery, and other uh, and and divorce. While I prepare to read this, this is the compilation. While I prepare to read that, I'm not saying, man, we have a lot of material, in our brethren. Can I tell you? Yeah, any topic you want. If you want to learn about gardening, if you want to learn about cooking, if you want to learn about uh, a trade, if you want to learn about preparation for parenthood, if you want to learn about preparation for marriage, if you want to learn about how to run a business, if you want to know how to go into ministry, whether with the church or if you want to go into personal ministry, we, are, we have so much in terms of resources. Man, it's that hard not left us. In darkness, and, and I believe us as Adventists, we are so blessed with with with, with so much light. And I, and you know, and let, let, I just let, let me see on course. Sure. Let me see on course. Sure. Well, we are really blessed with with, with, with so much, and not because we are better than anybody else. No. It was shown. So sorry, I was shown that it was when David was pure and walking in the counsel of God, that God called him a man after his own heart. When David departed from God and stayed his virtuous character by his crimes, he was no longer a man after God's own heart. And God did not in the least degree justify him in his sins, but sent Nathan, his prophet, with dreadful denunciations to David because he had transgressed the commandment of the Lord. So God never put up with this, with in essence. And I was, and I was sometimes we, we see, we say, but a special revelation from Ellen White. It's, it's even in the Bible, look at chapter 27. The last part of chapter 27 says, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. I, I think somebody somebody said something in the, in, the, in the chat. Yes, Demisha was was asked sharing a thought to say, could it be possible that David's view of himself as king, with the authority that came with it, was one of the factors that caused David to go ahead on into his sins? So, in a sense, could it be that perhaps David had a bout of haughtiness? It's, it's possible. It is possible. What mm -hmm. we do understand from the pen of inspiration and we're able to piece together in the story is that there came a time when David was 
relaxed. And, uh, you know, as soldiers, when we say relaxed, we don't mean that you don't re have time for recreation or you mm -hmm. don't rest from labor. But in a spiritual sense, we have to be cautious not to be relaxed. And this is especially important in our modern time because we have so many things around us which can become potential distractions. And if we let down our guard around them, remember earlier, yes, it was in First Samuel last week, we, we, we had raised this point, or touched on this point, that if the Ark of God being in the temple of, of, of Dagon could have caused you know, these things to happen. It was the spirit of God that was being invited there. And, you know, unholiness can last in the presence of holiness. Mm. On the flip side of that, some of the things that we allow into our, into our consciousness or subconsciousness, even, or into our homes, etc. what impact can these things happen? And we have to be cautious that we are not lowering our guard to think that this is just a mere movie or this is just a song or this is just a, a nice piece of art or whatever it may be, we could potentially be allowing the devil permission into our space, lest mm -hmm. we drop, lest we become comfortable friends. Amen, amen. Very, very, very solid point, um, David, you know? And as I said, I said that, you know, when we do these things, we are idle and we, we allow certain things. What we do is we tempt the devil to tempt us. Yes. You basically, tempt, basically tempt the devil, tempt the devil, tempt the devil to tempt you. All right. So we can we can move on to to David. Um, you want to move on to Absalom? It would be so nice to look at at Nathan when Nathan came to David. You touched on it a little bit in chapter mm -hmm. twelve when Nathan came to David. I love how Nathan approached David, but even more so, this is the path on which David started his recovery. And we can contrast this even with Saul to see what made David's repentance genuine versus what made Saul's repentance uh, more, more for sure. Yes? So, shall we look at that uh, briefly? Yeah, we yeah, can look at it. All right. So in, in chapter 12, we see whereby God sent Nathan to David. <clears throat> and Nathan came to him, you see in verse 1, with a, a, a story. It says, there were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb. And we know a ewe is a female lamb, which mm -hmm. he had brought, he had bought rather, so he paid for it. And he nourished it. It, it grew, grew up together with him and his children. And if you know mm -hmm. anything about, in Jamaica, we don't really have lamb, but we have goats. And for those who would have grown in perhaps rural areas, even though I think people in the city do have animals at times, which would be farm animals, not so common though. But a little boy, especially, I can imagine a little boy, a little girl having their little goat or their little sheep. They, they, they treat it so and nurture it. It's almost like a part of the family. So this is the picture that we're sitting here. So he had his little lamb. It ate of his own food, drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom. It was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man and who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd. So this traveler had his own flock. He was a rich man. He had options. And to, to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him, but he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So this rich man was having a visitor and instead of killing or making use rather of one of his own from the many that he possesses, he sought rather to use that of the poor man. And what was David's response? David was angry. In verse five it says, so David, David's anger was greatly aroused against the man you can imagine mm. as a king, David is saying, who could this be in my kingdom? And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And I don't take David's words lightly, you know, because remember what happened to the man who killed Saul, Saul. And he shall restore fourfold the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. But mercy, in verse 7, Nathan said to David, 
you are the man. Hmm. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. Friends, even when we saw David evading Saul, it wasn't David. It was God who was preserving David because he had a purpose for him. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that hold on, hold on. God gave David wives. Yes, that's what it says. So that is something we shall explore and look further into. But that is a bit of a tangent right now. So let's put yeah, a I sticky note right here to come, back, to come back to. Yes. So it says that, um, and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you so much more. So God was saying that I have given you all these things. And if you wanted more, I would have allowed you to enjoy more. But you did one of the most egregious of acts. And you took from what would have been the poor man in this context, the little that he had, neglecting the much that you have. And friends, is this our approach to sin sometimes? Whereby we neglect the abundance that God has given us to fetch little, the little that, because sin offers us nothing. It offers us but fleeting moments of pleasure. And then when it is ended, what comes next? Heartache, sorrow, destruction. Going back even into Genesis. God is a God of much and variety. Even though on the topic of marriage, we know that Israel had apostatized in that area and God bared with them. So the sticky note is there, so we'll explore it um, a little later. Nevertheless, in Genesis, of the abundance of the plants, every fruit bearing herb of this, fruit yielding herb of the field, you had to, you had for, for yourself as meat, but that one plant, that one tree that was to remain sequestered was not to be touched even. Man's heart wanted that which belonged not to them. It, it goes back to the topic of covetousness, a fundamental commandment, desiring that which is not pertaining to you. And so David's response now, David's response is one from which we can learn because David is not alone in this problem of the heart whereby we desire that which we should not, which Paul speaks about, that which I, uh, I want to do, I do not, and that which I should not do, that is what I do. Yes, so David is not alone in this struggle. His response is one which you can learn from. Uh, Elder, would you like to shed some more on, on the response of David? You, you know, um, when we get to the New Testament, we'll explore this um, subject a, a little more. And that is the subject of how are we really judge in the end? And I think this is, 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 a, is a little peak of how we are judging the end. Realize that it is David's own, David actually pronounced his own judgment. Yes. He shall pay for it fourfold. Many times, you know, Jesus said. That which you measure unto our next man, you know, it shall be measured unto you. Unto you. Indeed. So, you know, Jesus said in, in John 3, we love John 3, you know, read the first part. And Jesus said, listen, don't come to condemn you. You really condemn yourself. Mm. In the end, if it's not that God condemns us, you know, we, the truth, condemns us. Just having a knowledge of the truth comes condemns us. Um, in Romans 1, it, it Paul says that when you exchange the truth about God for a lie, 
your mind is darkened and God has no more, no more, God, God has no more power. The, the goodness of God that is supposed to bring you to repentance and repentance is really a change of your evil way of thinking. The Greek is really, the Greek, the Greek, the repentance in the Greek is really a change of your evil way, not of doing, but of thinking. Strikes and you know, and, 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 and if, if, we, if, we, if, I, if I may tangent a little bit here, I love the point of touching and I'm very excited to share. This matter of the mind is exactly what the battle is about. The battle is about our mind, who has authority and control of our mind, because whoever has authority of the seat of judgment, the mind, has control over the entire living soul. And so, mm -hmm. friends, that's why it's so important for us to preserve our minds, to preserve our mental health, to, to, to ensure that we follow the laws of health, we rest, we have proper nutrition that takes care of the, of, 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 of the brain function, the mind. Is like is like if you can think of the body as the hardware, mm -hmm. the software which powers everything is really the mind mindset. You, you, you know, so repentance in the Bible, uh, as David is really as I said, the mind is very important. And God wants so God wants control of our headquarters, and He won't for, force His way up there. But yes. we, we, part of us, Paul also said that God's goodness is supposed to bring us to repentance. That is, God's goodness is supposed to cause us to change our evil way of thinking. Yes. So when it is that we, we refuse to change our evil way of thinking, when God's goodness is revealed to us, that is, the, the light, as far as it's, uh, are the truth. We exchange that now for our life. For our life is dark. Our minds become darkened. So much so we can't see anymore. And God has no more, no, nothing, nothing else to do well than just to give us up. You know? Give it over to the reprobate mind. To the reprobate mind. And, and that is really exactly how we are condemned and destroyed. So David condemned himself. himself. You know, God, I, I don't really like how God, God did it here. David. In the class is on judgment. You know, when I was younger, we were young as children, you see. Um, and I and our father wanted to spank us. Well, father wanted to warn us. You know, when, whenever our father wanted to, 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 to discipline us, he, he just used the, 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 the strap, the belt, and he was just one and was would satisfy from that. You know, but um, when he wanted to just give us a warning. He would say, um, Lane, he called me Lane. Um, go on, look, look at a nice whip and car So he was sending me to, to go and, and to, 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 to get my, my own um, rod, you know, my own, my own whip. And of course, I wouldn't go. Likewise, I believe what God does is to allow us. In the end, we will actually decide our own fate. When we say God is just, we are deciding our own fate um, there and then. I think, uh, is it, let me shall I say something in, in the chat. She says, she says, it is unlikely for us to know ourselves, especially our negative character traits. We should Ask God to show us our simple ways as Nathan was able to show David his own ways from another perspective, perspective he could see and understand. Amen. 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 And if I may add, Hanif, it was David himself who said in Psalms 193, 23 to 24, well... Was it David who wrote that song? It's a question we should ask ourselves. I don't remember if it was David who wrote Psalm 39, 139. Perhaps it was. Nevertheless, the message is, the message is what matters most. Psalm 139, 20 to 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. 
Yeah. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Now that sounds like a man who was truly repentant. And this mm-hmm. echoes what Demetra, which did what Demetra says. And these are the things, friends, when we pray, let us elevate our prayers to ask for these more fundamental points. Lest I be mistaken, God cares for every aspect of our being. So there's nothing which we should refrain from asking God. Nothing. In that same breath, let us not forget to ask of him these things also. Ask God to search our hearts. Ask God to bring to our attention the things which we need to sacrifice and which we need to have cleansed from us. Ask God to, 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 to you know, supply the, 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 the emptiness once we overcome the sin, the emptiness that, 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 that is there. Ask God to supply a fulfillment for, for that space. To, you know? So these are very, very core things which we need to ask of God. And he who gives gifts, good gifts so freely will surely bestow it unto us. What we need to do is just be prepared for when the answer is given because chances are that which we hold dear is perhaps that which we might need to let go. As maybe uh, maybe the case of the rich ruler, the young ruler, I may be taking it a little out of context here, but bear with me. When the young ruler asked Christ, what more can he do? Christ said, sell everything that you have and come follow me. What this is saying is that, are we prepared to let go of even the things we most hold dear for the cause of God? Is there something that if God says, let go of this thing, are we prepared to let go of it? So while we ask God to search us and to create in us a new heart, the process of getting there, we need to remember that it is not an overnight process. It is a, it is a period of sanctification is the word we used. It's a period of, of trials and, and overcoming and, 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 and perhaps slipping away into the temptation, but remaining focused on Christ, we can and we will overcome. As God promised us, he who is the author of our faith is also the finisher of our faith and he will carry us to it. Amen, amen. You know, um, thanks very much, for that, David. You know, every time I say David, I remember I'm talking about David. <laughs> you know, so so we will find that after that, that we see that that, that led to, mm-hmm. uh, to David losing one child. That um, yes, um, your eyes white. That's what's her name? That was a, the um, Bathsheba. Bathsheba. Was was yes. it? We lost that child. I will find that even Absalom, Amnon, he lost Amnon afterwards. Absalom, yes. Amnon because Amnon raped um, his, his own sister. sister. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, I believe it, it was his stepsister, if you remember. His, so. his half sister, I believe. Yes, his, yes, his half sister. Yes, his half. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we see, we see that that's what two, two we gone, and then we have who was, who was the next one out of the rape came murder, came yes. murder. So, yes. so the Amnon, so, so Amnon died, and then we have um Absalom, no, Absalom, no, yes, so, so let's, look, power. You, let's look at Absalom, and, and I want us to look at it in the context of the great controversy. So, Absalom being a very um, handsome man, the Bible says that some is very shady. He said, you know, it's he had a lot of hair, you know. Um, Absalom too was so as Absalom uh, murdered his, his brother and, and, and he fled to, to a country and then, um, through through um, Joab, you know, Joab through well, well. David, Joab brought him back through David, in a sense, because David was sad and so forth. And then in that, Absalom, you know, 
But David never really um, wanted to see Absalom before. So what, what, what Absalom did was, was to ask him to call Joab, I believe. And Joab never, never turned up. And Absalom set Joab to feed on fire, you know, to get Joab's attention. And then, and that is how um, Absalom can get an audience with David. Absalom now, you know, and this is the part that I, I want us to look at, you see. Absalom being, after murdering his brother, um, getting his father's forgiveness and was restored somewhat, you know, as a child. Absalom went and, uh, and sat by the gates and when people come with their counsels, Absalom can say, you know, you have a point. That's a, that's a very good matter. You know? Oh, I, only if there was somebody, a deputy, you know, in the kingdom, the judge. Mm -hmm. You know, at least I would give you justice. Listen, listen, listen to what she, she said. Uh, Absalom said, um, verse 4 of chapter 15. Moreover, Absalom would say, Oh, that I were, oh, that I were made judge in the land, and everyone who has any suit or cause would come to me, then I would give them justice. I think. What oh, 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 do you think? What oh, do you think? Um, the, the angels in heaven reacted to, to this entire story. Now, uh, do you think it was familiar to them? It sounds. Uh, it sounds vaguely familiar. <laughs> it sounds. It sounds vaguely familiar. It sounds like, you know, I've heard two schools of thought. Some say history repeats itself. And I've heard some say history doesn't repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. So either way, take it. This something vague from the angels probably was wondering if it's a deja vu moment. Precisely. Who else sat out outside and said, listen, are you sure you're getting justice? Oh, if I could make judge in this place, then I would give you justice. But no, that's just a thought. I'm not judge, I'm just a little man. I can't keep you to you, you know, the, the same rebellion. I, I think God allowed these things so to play out just to say something to us who will read it afterwards and also to the entire universe looking on. And, and, and then God allowed the, the story to play out to the end. You know, and, and look, at, look, at, look at how gracious. Why you know, honey, if you know you're convicted me here. Yeah, it wasn't well, well, yeah. I, well, go ahead, man. Wasn't there somebody in the story before that was very gracious? You know, that that sought to win Lucifer. You know, if you, if you, if you read if you read pages and prophets, the man in my big evangelistic campaign that helped me go so with Lucifer and the angels would, would probably go over go over to Lucifer and say, listen. Hear me out, Virgin. God is just. God has our best interest at heart. Lucifer, you know, like sometimes preach, you preach and people feel convicted and think about it. I said, but. And that was what went on in the God. God tried to win over Lucifer. And Lucifer exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And his mind was darkened. And by saying, I will give you justice, after I was saying, listen, David isn't just. He's not giving Don't you justice. Lucifer said the same thing that God isn't just. Mm. You know, you were, you were saying, that, um, David. Uh, it was just hitting a little too close to home, you know. You know, sometimes um, I see it's nine o'clock and we, 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 I just want to wrap up on yeah, this point. Yeah, and we, yeah, Good. man. Time fly when you're having fun. I was going to wrap up on this point, and then when we're closing off, I'll share something about the overall story, a takeaway of hope. However, it hits a little close to home in the sense that sometimes, you know, you might do work, or you're part of some organization, whatever the case is. Let's say, for example, you work somewhere, and you're just an administrative level staff. You're, you're not you're not manager. You're not executive. You know any other big position there, 
Yes. And sometimes if we're not careful, we'll have the tendency to say, oh, a them in a them meeting, make them decision there, you know. Um, in, in our sense to allude and oftentimes to clearly say that if I had the, the power or if I had the influence, I would be making these sets of decisions and I would be basically executing a better way of operation. And even when you're just talking, I'm realizing that that, that mindset really is a mindset coming from, from the devil himself. That are, or, or to put it at least a more milder way, that mindset runs parallel to the mindset that, that, that Lucifer would have had in heaven, right? The mindset to say that I can do a better job. I would, 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 would if I was in, in power, if I was making a decision, we wouldn't be having these issues. We wouldn't be having these problems. It's I, 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 you know? And, and so we cast judgment and, and execute judgment against those who are in leadership not realizing that you know the mindset behind it is perhaps a more dangerous path so many mm -hmm. of us don't go the path that lucifer went down whereby he rebelled and he you know was cast out of heaven eventually or the path of absalom whereby he also rebelled and sought to kill his father and met a tragic end we may not go that exact path but the mindset is there and out of that mindset who knows what can come i remember we talk about the mind repentance is changing your evil way of thinking you know and, and again that's a very powerful point point david it's a very powerful point um you you, you know you, you you want to just look at the end of David, David's life and then we just go say a one and a two sentence and it are sum it up and then we pray and close. I will sum up with the end of David's life. We saw whereby David at the, at the death of his son, at the death of Absalom, David was yet again mourning so this, this brother mourned when Saul died, the man who sought to kill him. And yet again, we see him mourning over Absalom. I can understand him mourning over Absalom even more than was Saul, to be frank, because at least Absalom was his own, his own flesh and blood. And I could imagine the confluence of emotions knowing that that person whom you loved so much that you would give so much for, that person sought to take you out, sought to kill you, and died a tragic death. Um, I, I, well, I, well, David, sorry to cut you, but I just, want to introduce, I want to, just want to introduce this right here. What does that say about God? In the end, wouldn't God be mourning over even Lucifer? Lucifer was a very good friend, you know? Lucifer was, Lucifer mean light bearer. Lucifer used to tell the angels about God. The same way the bright man is God, the same way that he's used. Mm -hmm. Lucifer is, a, is really the Latin for bright man is God. And Lucifer was like, Jesus, being light. Imagine what the God would feel for his children, his friends. Would what have the emotions that God experienced. If David can experience a conference of emotions, imagine what more God goes through. Whoa. You know, we're, we're, we're going to continue, sorry. <laughs> oh man, that's an important point of highlighting, bro. Thank you for that. So at the end of David's life, we saw whereby he was, you could say, restored, right? David, um, David continued to reign. He was restored as king, yes. Um, and, out of, and, 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 and out of David's reign, we saw the rise of Solomon eventually. And eventually, out of David's reign, we saw the rise of the true fulfillment of Genesis 3.15, you know? We saw the true fulfillment of the, the lamb that was promised to, 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 to Abraham, yes? We saw the true fulfillment of the theocratic king that would save the people and lead them to 
the promised land. And I love the quarter that we just ended, the book of Hebrews, where it talks about a better covenant. It talks about a better promise. It talks about a better, a better mediator. This all focuses back on Jesus. And it is no, no, it is no, um, it is no coincidence then why the book of Samuel, which originally was one, even though now it's divided into first and second Samuel, really is treated and often and, and again it restated last week. Even when in taken with, with, with the book of Kings and Chronicles, they're, they're usually they're generally one major book, but but Samuel itself, or that book, there's no it is no coincidence why the book started with a prayer, it ended with a prayer, and at the center of it is the hope, the promise given of a king that will lead God's people to true freedom. And to, so that's, that's the takeaway for me from the book of, of Samuel, that God is faithful to his promises. Even when those who are, who are given responsibility may stumble, God is still in control <clears throat> and he has even better promises for us. You know, David, that's a very beautiful point to end on. You know, so friends, thanks so much for joining us as um, we distill the truth about God in the 66. You know, um, God has really been with us thus far. I've been learning a lot. And the Spirit is really building the evidence for our faith. Join us next week where we'll be focusing on the books of first and second kings as you look at the one question what does this say about God shall we pray gracious father in heaven we thank you so much for the everlasting love we thank you so much for your graciousness we thank you so much lord for presenting the truth about yourself we thank you lord for the many times in which you would have put your reputation on the line just to preserve righteousness, just so you can say something about yourself, not for you, Lord, but for us, because we needed that. We needed the light. We needed the truth, because it is through the truth, through this truth, accepting the truth about you and your character that we are made safe to save. Lord, even as we go through these books, may you keep us motivated. May your will be done, great God, and may you guide us. Thank you so much for all who participated tonight, and may we see you high and lifted up. Thank you again. These we ask. No other name than your son, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.